Welcome. Welcome to Warehouse Programs at the Geffen Contemporary. I'm Amanda Hunt, Director of Education and Senior Curator of Programs. Welcome to our first public program of 2020, Christina Quarles. Christina is someone I've had the pleasure of knowing for a few years now, a peer of mine who I'm just so proud of um, and thrilled to see your evolution in the work and just in the practice and being here in LA together is a really special thing. So when Bennett Simpson and Rebecca Lowry, who will say a few words in just a moment, the curators of the 40th anniversary show on View Next Door, put this whole thing together. Um, really an opportunity for us to show the amazing things in our collection. Christina's work is a part of that collection now and just what a pleasure it is to have that come full circle. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you all of you for joining us. Um, before I bring Rebecca and then Christina up to the stage, I just want to say a few things about Christina and the work and a little bit of her background. Um, for those of you who do know the work, you know it. Uh, for those who don't, it's really sumptuous, um, kind of unsuspecting, um, fluid, free, incredibly uh, technically executed. You're always surprising me every time I get close and then far away again. Um, the use of figuration is something that, you know, is, is long trodden in this arc of art history, but Christina does it differently. So it's, uh, again, really exciting to have her here to just share on another artist's work, uh, Paul Mapagi Sapoya, who also shares space in the same gallery in the 40th show. Um, but back to Christina, uh, she lives and works here in Los Angeles and received her MFA from the Yale School of Art, uh, holds a BFA from Hampshire College. She was a 2016 participant at Skowhegan School for Painting and Sculpture. Um, man, this could go on for a long time. Uh, you've done incredible things. I think to focus, namely, just like on this moment, uh, your biggest solo presentation to date is coming up at the MCA Chicago opening April 4th. <laughs> Um, your, uh, Christina's work will be featured in a group show called Radical Figures coming up at the Whitechapel Gallery in London um, at the beginning of next month. Uh, you've had incredible exposure in a lot of places including Made in LA, uh, the Hammer Museum in 2018, Trigger, Gender as a Tool and as a Weapon at the New Museum in 2017, Fictions at the Studio Museum in Harlem in 2017 among many others, um, and just thank you again. Without further ado, Rebecca Lowry, and then Christina Quarles. Thanks again. Just briefly, as a co-organizer of the current exhibition, The Foundation of the Museum, MOCA's Collection, I wanted to say just a brief word about Christina's work in the show. Um, the occasion, occasion for this exhibition is MOCA's 40th anniversary um, as an institution and as a collecting body. So we, of course, look to the past for this show, look to very important and foundational pieces in MOCA's collection. We look to work that we have never before had a chance to show. Um, but then, of course, we looked to the present and, by that, the future of MOCA's collecting with recent acquisitions. The show opened in May um, of last year, and at that time, the painting of Christina's in the show was our most recent acquisition. And as one of the most exciting young painters in Los Angeles, we knew without a doubt that her work had to be part of the show. Um, if you haven't been in yet, I hope you get a chance to walk through after the talk. Um, Christina's work is installed in a small gallery um, that's intended to be salon style, not in the sense of the hanging style, um, but in intellectual and social gathering. So it's a bunch of figurative work, a ton of different approaches to figuration. And Paul Mpagi Sepoya's work is also included in that gallery. So the idea was that all of these works had lots to say to one another. Um, different positionalities, different identities, different approaches to figuration. And Christina Quarles and Paul Mpagi Sepoya's work certainly has a lot to say uh, to one another. So we're so pleased to have Christina here tonight to speak to us about that. Christina. Hi. <laughs> Happy New Year. Um, so I, I had kind of like prepared this talk initially with the idea that we would be in the gallery. So a lot of this is about 
how important it is to do close looking at actual art objects. So sorry that we're like in front of a screen, but thank you all for coming. Um, and yeah, I'm excited about doing this talk and sort of walking through my thought process of Paul's work and a few other pieces in the same gallery. So just real quick, did, did everyone get a chance to look through the exhibition for the most part? Um, all right, well, the show's up for like another week, I think, so <laughs> you can double check it. But um, yeah, I, when Amanda asked me to do this talk, I really wanted to use it as an opportunity to think outside of my own studio practice. I think a lot of times artists can get sort of isolated in their own mind, and so I wanted to spend some time in Paul's mind. Um, and when Amanda said I could choose whoever I wanted to speak about, I knew immediately that Paul was the artist that I wanted to really spend some time getting to know because Paul and I have had really just like so many different moments where our paths have crossed and it's like getting to the point where it's like beyond coincidence and it feels like this would be a really great moment to just, before we are in any more shows together to, um, to just really look at his work and offer my interpretation of his work uh, since we're so oftentimes in the same room together. So I first met Paul, it was uh, early 2017, it was like around this time of year and we were both getting the Rima Hortman Emerging Artist Grant and we had both just graduated from grad school. Paul graduated from UCLA in 2016 and I think at that point in his kind of artistic career, Paul has had like, he was a resident at the Studio Museum and um, he was already in major museum collections. So I won't speak to his sort of experience of winning that award, but I know for me, it was really this, this moment where I felt like I was getting my work out there more and I was having a chance to have more studio visits with curators and with writers around town. And so, what I noticed after meeting Paul that night at the like Grantee Award Gala uh, was that whenever I had somebody in my studio, it seemed like they were either on their way to Paul's studio or they had just come from Paul's studio. So, like I was oftentimes be being asked to give directions to Paul's studio, even though like like the weird thing is that like Paul and I actually don't have studios that are that close to each other, so it didn't really make sense. But I really, I, I kind of loved the idea that people that were in my space and people that were in Paul's space were thinking about the work in tandem and that there was already this sort of curatorial conversation that was stirring about our work. And so then in the fall of 2017, Paul and I, we had our first opportunity of exhibiting together at uh, the New Museum in New York. And we were both put in Joanna Burton and Sarah O'Keefe's uh, really monumental exhibition titled Trigger Gender as a Tool and as a Weapon. Um, and they used Paul's photograph for all the, <laughs> the bus marquees. Um, but at the time, I, I got the sense that Trigger was a really special exhibition. Um, and now that I'm, ooh, something's happening. <laughs> now that I'm looking back on it, it, it really feels like it was a very monumental and exciting turning point in how curators have been thinking about exhibitions ever since. And so one way that, I, that I've thought of Trigger over the last few years is that it really, it really felt like it was sort of the first like post-Trump exhibition. And I say that like knowing full well that the Whitney Biennial happened earlier that year in 2017, but there was this sense, and I don't know if you guys remember the Whitney Biennial that year, but there was like a lot of controversy around certain works of art in that show and about certain things that were included in that exhibition. And it really felt like a lot of that controversy was swirling around curatorial decisions that were being made really with the idea that we were in this sort of tail end of an Obama presidency and that we would be entering into a Hillary Clinton presidency. And so I think a lot of the, the sort of outrage that happened around that show was made because we were really sort of entering into a new stage and how people wanted to see images and talk about work 
and kind of what people's tolerance level was <laughs> for certain types of images. And I particularly remember in 2017 because I was doing a lot of studio visits at the time. And I remember that there was really this sense of kind of urgency about what we could all be doing um, with our daily lives, our daily practices, um, our career choices. And I found that when I was having people in the studio, um, there was just, there was a lot of people that would just ask me point blank, like, why are you making art right now? Like, what is the point of making art? Like, should we all just like become lawyers and join the ACLU? Um, and I like, I kind of, my instinct was that art was important. I mean, because it's what I have dedicated all of my life to. But it got me thinking to exactly why art is important. And the thing that really sticks with me is the idea that we have to think about art not as a product, but as a process. Because I think that when we, when we imagine art to be a product, it's actually a very clunky political tool. I think that art is, it just, it's not the best medium as a product to enact political change. I, th I find that something like graphic design can be a really rich medium to generate powerful images that can communicate political action. But with art, I think that we need to think of it not as a product, but as a process. And in that process, it's both a process of making work, but it's also a process of looking at work. And so the way that I think about this is, it's, I, I feel like <laughs> embarrassed about saying this in front of my aunt, who knows a lot about neuroscience. Um, but so like, I'm probably wrong about this, but I think of the brain as being like, Basically, the way that you have like roads in Europe or like somewhere like that has had a city for many hundreds of years, and the way that the roads that exist today, they started off as these footpaths, and then those footpaths were used over and over again, and then people started taking animals on those footpaths, and then carts on those footpaths, and then cars on those footpaths, and they got paved, and the next thing you know, they're like established roads that we drive on today, and so. I think about the way that we sort of solidify ways of thinking sort of as that idea of the sort of repeated action that gets paved into these solidified ways of thinking that are not necessarily true or false, they just are the way that we've done it over and over again. And so by thinking, by thinking of art as a process, it can really be this way that we can start to forge new paths and make new connections. and. I think that Trigger as an exhibition was really so groundbreaking and in many ways like really a fundamentally queer exhibition because it created a space for that process. It, it created a space for like questioning ideas about what it was to be in a body, to have gender, um, to think of it as both a tool and as a weapon. And it was in that process that I think that that show really crafted a new way of thinking through how exhibitions were moving forward. So after Trigger, uh, Paul and I were in a lot more shows together. And so this is at a group show at David Zwerner. And so Paul's photographs are those two on the left. Um, and then you can see this sculpture is for reference. Um, I'm sure that artist wouldn't want me saying that, but. Um, and so there's my painting in the same room. And so that was the last summer, the summer before that. Um, this is like a screenshot of like this insane sort of reposting of each other's stories back and forth because uh, Paul and I were in the same room at Cam Houston at their Stonewall 50 exhibition last summer. And so, I don't know, we were just like tagging each other back and forth. Um, and then, like, let's see what this video works. Oh, yeah. So, like, this is, like, me in a mag. Like, this is very typical. Like, I'll be getting a magazine that I'm in. I'll take a crazy video. Zoom in on a drawing. Don't worry about it. And then, like, Paul will be, like, the next thing in the magazine. Um, 
And like, yeah, so there's just this sort of like, we just kind of keep crossing paths again. And so with that in mind, and you know, even today, I mean, this is a installation shot from a few rooms over where Paul and I are once again in an exhibition together, sharing not only the exhibition space, but the same room in the museum. And so with the idea of using the process of looking, as, looking at art as this sort of way of opening up new thinking, new pathways of thinking, I wanted to really carefully look at Paul's work and look at it together with you. Um, and again, on a screen, unfortunately. Um, and I wanted to really try to offer as much of my own insight into Paul's work as possible because Paul and I have this very strange relationship in that we are, we're very familiar with each other in a social way, but I haven't spent a lot of time formally looking at his work, so I haven't read a lot of articles about him, even though we're always in the same magazines. Um, and when I see his work in a show, it's always like a crazy opening. So I wanted to really look just at the work in this exhibition and try to not cloud my mind with other, other people's views of the work in this show. And so I really, I mean, I would also just encourage you in general, I mean, I think I recognize a lot of you in the audience as artists, so I'm sure you do this anyway, but, um, but I think we'll oftentimes, I know that I do it, but we'll look outside of a work of art to try to find answers to that work of art. And it's tempting to want to just read wall texts and look to other people's explanations, to curatorial uh, talks like this one. Um, and, and I think that that's, it's an important aspect to the work, but so much can really be gained from just doing some close looking at a work of art. And I think this is because art is first and foremost a visual language. And so if we only rely on verbal language, something is inevitably going to be lost in translation. So I had a professor once in grad school who actually assigned us to look at a single painting for an entire hour. And we could pick whatever painting we wanted to, but we had to look at it for an hour. And I thought this would be like, really just like the most boring hour of my life. Um, but I found that the more that I looked at this painting, the more questions would arise. And the more questions that would arise, the more answers I could discover, which would lead to new questions. And, you know, as an, as an artist, I'll spend a lot of time in my studio just looking at my own work. So I would say a lot of time is spent not painting, but just looking. And so an artist's relationship to their own work is really a relationship of looking. And so a lot can really be gained from just kind of describing what you're looking at and narrating it back to yourself and, and creating that meditative space, again, where this sort of political richness can exist in the process of in engaging with artworks. And so just like one quick preface, uh, which is that because I didn't do much like research <laughs> to prepare for, um, for talking about Paul's work outside of what I know about him, I just wanted to say that what I'm going to say today is just simply my take on the work. And so, you know, if you are interested or if you really disagree with what I say, like Paul is an extraordinary artist who has been very generous with his work um, in that he is in many shows, he's very prolific, but he's also done countless interviews and podcasts and there's a lot that's been written about him. So just do a Google search and you'll find so much about Paul. Okay, so let's dive in. Um, so hopefully you guys saw this in person and have taken a little bit of a look at it here, faded on a projector screen. Um, and I'm just gonna walk you through what I saw first when I encountered this photo. And so the first thing that I see are three arms and I quickly see the arms. I think it's because I live in my own body. I live in a human body. I interact with 
other humans. Um, I think it's also because I paint the figure, but for whatever reason, the arms are the most prominent thing to me in this image. And I'm able to conclude that I'm looking at the arms that belong to two different bodies. I see uh, darker skin on two of the arms and then this more sort of olive complexion on the front arm. And other than that, the only thing I can determine about the arms is that they're really kind of buff. <laughs> That's like the only other thing. Um, and so because I'm thinking of this idea of arms, the next thing I see are two legs. And I immediately see these legs as being non-human legs. And I was trying to know, I was trying to really think about like if this was a bias based on knowing Paul's work or if it was obvious, but like, I don't know, does everyone kind of know what those legs belong to? I just was curious. Like tri tripod, maybe? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so I, I see them as being tripod legs. So two tripod legs, three arms. And so the next thing I need to kind of grapple with is the fact that the position of the bodies, there's no reason why the body should be fragmented if they were in real life, because it's not like the edge of the frame is cutting them off. So I'm left to wonder what has led to this image being manipulated. And because it's photography, I'm conditioned to read a, photog a photograph as something that's capturing something that we would see in the real world. And so, whether or not that statement is true, the way that I see photographs are as records of something that's actually happened. And so any abstraction or fragmentation then is inevitably the result of some sort of post-production manipulation. And so when I'm looking at this, my first guess is maybe Paul did collage with this work, um, but I immediately rule that out because the image which this is a photograph of an image, but if you look at it in the gallery, it's a single, smooth, cohesive surface. So the next place that my mind goes is maybe this was done with Photoshop. Um, but now this is where, if you look closely, you're actually like really rewarded. I don't know how much you can really see this blown up, but there's like a small piece of clear tape, and then there's like a small smudge in the right-hand corner. So when I look at that piece of tape in the top center and then the smudge in the right-hand corner, and I combine that with the fact that the darker complexion arms are more blurred and this olive-skinned arm is more in focus, I'm able to conclude that what we're actually looking at is a photograph that was taken in a mirror of the photographer's reflection and photography equipment most of which is being blocked by another cut photograph that was taped onto that same mirror. And so what I love about this is that it's a relatively simple and analog act of just taping a photograph to a mirror and taking another picture of it. And yet, for me, I really am able to feel this sort of sense that what Paul is speaking to is the complexities of how we experience time. And because I'm conditioned to read a photograph as being, again, the sort of index of something that's actually happened, I have to conclude that this sequence of events entailed taking a picture first and then setting up this composition to create this image. And so what I'm seeing is actually this idea, I, I kind of visualize it as being this like accordion of time being stretched out by Paul and then collapsed again into a single moment, which is this photograph. And so I start to imagine all the things that had to come before this image in order to create this image. So I see I see suddenly all the different edges that are within the photograph that's been cut. And suddenly I'm able to notice that there's a mirror in that photograph. And I'm able to see this pretty quickly because the brightest color in this photograph is this blue fabric. And that blue fabric's repeated. And that draws my eyes down to the hand, which is also repeated. 
And then I see the doubling of the edge of these other printed photographs, which are normally not seen by a viewer in a museum space, as evident by the fact that the piece is framed in the gallery. And so then I'm suddenly thinking about ideas of memory and of time and of how, how much we are influenced by the people that have occupied spaces before us. And I'm questioning maybe this has happened in this gallery, or in Paul's studio before, and then was photographed, and then he's retaking a picture of it. So simply by doing an act like taping a photograph onto a mirror, I'm suddenly thinking about memory and about the idea of what occupies a space and what all the things that can define an instant that are not represented literally or tangibly in a space. And I think about collaboration when I think about this idea of a memory that's happened in the space that's then recaptured to create a completely new image. And I know with Paul, the idea of collaboration with other people, with his subjects, and with remnants of his studio process are very important to him. And so I think this idea of collaboration really becomes quite potent once I see the idea of this, again, just this simple act of taping a photograph to a mirror. So the next thing I start to look at, now I'm starting to like get to more like nitpicky things that I notice. Um, so I notice that there's a little bit of hair up there on the right of the cut photograph. Um, and when I see that bit of hair, I'm suddenly wondering about the faces that are missing from this picture. So there's at least two human faces, as well as the face of a camera that are being obscured from view. And the idea of including faces and not including faces is something that I think about a lot in my own studio practice. And so I'm just going to go briefly to my own work. Um, so this is my painting that's in this exhibition in the same room. Um, and I'll often include greater articulation of the hands and the feet in my work rather than the faces in the work. And the reason why I do this is because I will often describe these works as being portraits, but they are not portraits of what it is to look onto another person. They're instead portraits of what it is to be in your own body looking out into the world. And so I think about how we're really at this kind of strange disadvantage to ever getting a sense of who we are as a whole or as a complete person because we really favor face-to-face -face interactions. So when I look at another person or when I'm in a social setting, I'll mostly just look at them in their face, eye to eye, have a conversation, and I'll only just maybe casually glance at what they're wearing or their body, but I'm for the most part looking at their face. But my understanding of my own face is this sort of vague idea. Like I can see my face in a mirror or in photographs or in video, but it's it's always this delayed or flattened or reversed image. And so when I interact with another person, I'm seeing them as this sort of cohesive being, and I'm seeing myself as fragmentation. I'm seeing myself as these sort of fragmented limbs and legs. And I think it's this strange thing where it's like, on the one hand, we really know who we are, but on the other hand, we don't experience ourselves in real time as being these sort of cohesive faces, the way that we see every other person. And so the way that I know myself in relation to everybody else is as fragments. So I think I'm going to take just a second away from this photograph and actually kind of go into like my experience of being one of Paul's subjects for uh, this cover for Vogue Ukraine. <laughs> um, and so this was like kind of the kind of this very interesting experience of getting to work with Paul as a photographer, as him being a photographer and me being a subject sitting for him uh, in a group setting. And so I was asked to participate in this sort of, you know, fun group of people um, for the cover of Vogue. And I said 
yes, because, I mean, it's super cool to be on the cover of Vogue. Um, but I also had a, like, a lot of mixed feelings about doing this because I, up until that point, had had a lot of really kind of, I don't know, not always great experiences uh, on photo sets for magazines. And I think that that's because, like, I mean, I'm comfortable in my body, but I'm also not like the typical cover girl for Vogue, um, obviously. So I always feel like a little awkward on set. And I feel awkward mostly because I feel like there's like not, I, there's no clear understanding with like what to do with my body on a photo set. Um, and I also feel awkward because I feel like the image that I have in my head of how I look is never the image that makes it to print. And it's just like really kind of, it's this like embarrassing moment of seeing like the magazine come out and being like, oh, that's what I looked like on set? Okay. Um, okay, so like this is like an example. This is like my embarrassing part of the lecture. <laughs> um, so this is me getting ready for a photo shoot for New York Magazine in 2017. And it was <laughs> like noticing actually that there's this like funny photograph behind me that looks like there's like a dead person in the room, but um, it's just a photograph. <laughs> um, so I was, I was doing this photo shoot for New York Magazine to promote Trigger. And like, I f the reason why I was like okay with showing you this kind of embarrassing moment in my life is that I feel like we've all like done this. Like, I do feel like we look at ourselves in the mirror before going out and we like are confident in how we look more or less. And we'll even like take a selfie and like make sure that we look good. And then we leave and it like might not be for a magazine, but it might just be like, your friend or your family member will like take a picture of you and put it on Instagram or Facebook and like you just look horrible and it's like such a shock and you're like maybe they don't like me like I don't know why they put this up like I like literally had a friend once stop talking to a person because she was like they always put up this picture where like they look amazing and I look terrible and I think they just I don't think they want to be my friend anymore so anyway so this is what I thought I looked like going to the photo shoot and like, this is what I look like in the photo shoot, which is like, you know, it's fine, but it's like a lot more like chins than I'm used to seeing in a mirror. And like, I don't know, it's just like my bangs aren't doing much, like everyone else looks cute, but like, I don't know, whatever. Like, but I think that like the shock that happens is it's, it's not just that like we don't look good. I think it's this shock that like we have this idea of what we are like in our mind and then that's completely contradicted by other people and a photograph that somebody puts on Instagram or in a magazine is like just this proof that like the way that you know yourself is really not the way other people know you and it's this sort of like I don't know it's it's like this embarrassing moment of feeling like oh my god like that's what I look like to you guys um, so it's this strange phenomenon. So I, I came into Paul's photo shoot like with all that baggage um, that I think, I hope we all kind of share. I hope I'm not alone in this. Um, and I knew I was gonna do like another group shot, which is always hard because, you know, everybody has to look kind of good in the group shot. So maybe sometimes nobody looks good. Um, and it's gonna be on Vogue. But when I got to Paul's studio, he immediately like put me and everybody else on set at ease because he really encouraged us all while we were getting ready and trying on fun clothes. He, he told us all to really spend some time playing with this camera that he had set up on a tripod facing a mirror. And he just was like, take pictures and play around. It's, you know, it's digital photography, so it doesn't cost him anything extra to take a bunch of throwaway pictures. Um, and suddenly there was this experience where there was no disconnect between the way I saw myself and the image that was being produced because I was taking a picture of myself looking back at myself. And so in this sense, I really feel like Paul takes the idea of being in your own body and looking out into the world a step further and he creates these images that are recording what it is to be in your own body looking out and back onto your body. So his work is really capturing the moment of you performing your own image back to yourself. 
And it's this, it's this very intimate and specific moment, I think, that, I mean, I guess, it's funny, I was like, my wife can't be here today because she sprained her ankle, um, which Paul also just sprained his ankle. It's like another way that we connect. Um, but, like, so I can embarrass her because she's not here, but, um, like, the face that she makes when she's looking at herself in the mirror is not any face I've ever seen her make before. So, like, and I think that, like, we all... We all have that performance of ourself that we do back to ourselves, and that's how we know ourselves. Um, and so Paul is capturing this in real time with the camera there as well. And I think the idea of the camera on the tripod is really helpful for this, for me as a viewer, to feel like I'm really being invited to be included in this process because even though it's a very intimate, private moment that is being captured, and you can even see in this photo, like, the kind of tender moment that the hand has on the tripod. Um, yet somehow, I think it's because I'm, when I'm looking at this photograph in the gallery, I'm at the same distance that the photographer would be at taking the picture. And there's something about my physical relationship to the photograph as an object that makes me not feel like I'm like being a voyeur, but I feel like I'm participating in this continuum that started with this olive arm and moves on to this darker complexion set of arms and then is now including me moving forward. And so with this idea of taking a picture of yourself, performing an image of yourself back to yourself, um, it starts to make me question like what is the true portrait? Like, is it more accurate to see how somebody else sees you, or is it more accurate to see an image that would capture how you see yourself? And I wonder, like, if we're, are we defined by how we see ourselves, or are we defined by how other people see us? And I imagine, sort of like, you know, most things, I imagine that the answer is somewhere in between those two poles, and I, Actually, though, like what I really think is that the answer is that there is a third option. And I think that that third option is that there's something completely new that emerges from the negotiation of those two points. And I think it's a constant back and forth of the idea of how you see yourself and how other people see you. And it's, a, it's kind of this reverberation that gets continued until we get closer and closer to the singular point. Okay, so with the idea of portraiture and what's true and what's false, I wanted to just briefly turn to another piece in the same room. And this is a painting by Lynette Yudom Boyachi. <laughs> I did it. Um, and so I wanted to do just a quick read of the work. And when I look at this painting, I see a seated figure um, on a chair. They appear to be black. They are male presenting. They seem to be in a room wearing clothing that is, it's like, it's specific enough to feel familiar, but it's also, I mean, I could say that this is from 1925, or I could say it's from 2018. Like, I'm not sure exactly what time period this is in. Um, I'm seeing the figure, this is very hard to see here, but paintings in the next room. Um, but I, the figure seems to be wearing tights, so I think maybe they're a performer or a dancer. But the point is, is that it's not a nude. They're not in a surreal location. It feels very grounded in reality. And so then, because I'm able to accept where this person is and what they're wearing, I then can spend a lot of time just focusing on the face and on the pose. And when I look at the figure's face, I see, I see really just a lot of specificity. I see such careful attention pay, paid to the detail of this face and of this person. And I really believe that this person exists, and I believe that the painter of this painting knew this person intimately. And I begin to think back to the representation of black figures throughout art history and how often in the hands of white artists, individuality of the subject gets reduced to type or to stereotype or to caricature. But this figure is very present and very alive and is very, it's very much an active agent in its own individuality. 
And so what's interesting, though, with all of that in mind, of that sort of like cold read of the painting, is that then if I do some research, and this is where research is good, um, I find out that Lynette's work is, is not depicting real people. She's actually weaving fictional characters with her paintings. And so the way that this process is described is like an author writing a piece of fiction and developing a character that's very real and believable but doesn't exist, doesn't exist in our world. And so the idea that she is weaving such a believable figure from her own imagination nevertheless suggests that she has spent a lot of time looking at the figure and looking at figures like this, looking at, you know, different body types and different hands and faces. And the only way to create an image like this with no photographs and no model is to have spent a lot of time in front of people and in front of models. Um, and again, this, this, this idea of linear time and the process of of mastering a craft being presented in the single moment of a painting, similar to Paul's work, is happening in this painting. And so another thing that I think helps me appreciate this painting is to think about the speed at which it was painted. And there are actually physical clues in the painting itself that suggest that this was made in one or two sittings. And those can be found in the moments of raw canvas that peek through. There's these sort of quicker brush strokes in the wall of the piece. And also the figure's face, I mean, even things like the eye is just, I believe it's just the canvas or gessoed canvas coming through. And so something that looks incredibly masterful was just done in possibly a single sitting. And I know that again, through research, that she does do her paintings fairly quickly. And again, this, this does speak to years of perfecting this craft and years and years of practicing this single moment being enacted in a, in a day to make one of these paintings. I think they're made in a day. Need to fact check that. Um, and so I think it's, it's like it's tempting to want to get fixated on the fact that this person doesn't exist and you know, start to ask those questions again of like, what is real and what is fiction and portraiture and how much, even if it is a real person, is the artist influencing the way that they look and all of that. But I think what's more interesting to me is to consider the fact that if she's not using a model and she's not using a photograph and she's not referencing a real person, Lynette is really just able to be absorbed in the process of painting. And she's able to create a painting that is just a conversation back and forth between a formal process of making a work and not looking outside of the painting to develop this final image. And so the reason why I find this so fascinating is probably because I also don't work with sketches or models or photographs. I just work from my own mind, uh, which again is influenced by years and years of figure drawing um, and practice. But I think that this sort of ongoing negotiation between the intention and then the actuality and having it go back and forth, I think that that, that really relates to the idea that first fascinated me about Paul's work. And that's this idea of self-reflection and this idea of negotiating a sort of third space through that negotiation that comes from what you put out in informing what you then see and then what you see informing what you put out again. And so it's, it's this idea of self-reflection that I think is, it's unique and it's not, it's very much not self-portraiture because self-portraiture is kind of the presentation of yourself out to the world, it's one directional. But this idea of self-reflection is really this sort of ongoing back and forth and reverberation, again, where I feel like this idea for a new thing, a third thing can come up. And, um, and I think that's what's so powerful about many of the pieces in the show, and particularly these ones. So that's that.